Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Hatchie River Conservancy. Thank you, Claire, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I am your host, Scott Williams, and this is our special Elvis Week episode that we do each year. Um, Claire, before I introduce today's very special Elvis Week guest, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, in honor of Elvis Week, I thought it was only appropriate that I pick something that was musical. So in our Tennessee room, I found the Matthew Sheck Upright Piano, which was built in 1890, and it's currently on display in our Tennessee room. And it's just, it's a beautiful piece, and I just really enjoyed um, in learning about it. So I learned that the scale design um, of these square pianos is radically different from the norm, and that's what makes it so special. I you can read all that. about it in the Tennessee room. I do see people in there playing it every once in a while. Do you play the piano? I took piano lessons for about six months as a child. So yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how to do chopsticks? You could do that. I can do chopsticks. I can play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do that. We'll do that next. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have two very special guests for our special Elvis Week episode this year. The first is Jerry Schilling, and then the second is going to be Alicia Dean. After the break, Alicia is um, the marketing promotions and event specialist at Elvis Presley Enterprises. She's going to tell us a little bit about Elvis Week. But before then, we've got Jerry Schilling, who I'm proud to say is a friend of mine. Um, He is, um, I would have to say, Elvis's uh, closest friend. He's had an an impressive career as um, a talent manager. Uh, He is currently managing the Beach Boys, but his his list of accomplishments is huge. We're going to talk all about it. Uh, Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Scott, and to uh, talk to you again after all, the, you know, a long time. I know it does. It seems like I blinked. Uh, this is Claire. Uh, she's she's our co-host. Hi, Claire. Hello. How are you? So, good, yeah, and you. Claire um, is not a huge Elvis fan. So we're going to like, you know, there's people out there that aren't Elvis fans. So, you know, we'll be talking to her as well so that she can learn a little bit more about Elvis and you and your whole story. But I'm also really interested in just you in general and sharing your story with our listeners, because I am fortunate enough to get to know your personal story and how inspirational it is. And Discovery Park is all about inspiring children and adults to see beyond. So, Tell us a little bit about uh, your life and, and how things got started. Well, um, speaking of children and what you guys are doing there, um, um, I, I grew up in North Memphis, uh, uh, and um, my mother had passed away when I was an infant. And uh, so I had a pretty bleak childhood. I lived with relatives, whatever. We all lived in North Memphis, which was the poor side of Memphis, uh, Scott, as you know. Uh, Same place where Elvis lived. And, um, you know, um, there's always hope. And, I mean, it it wasn't a terrible childhood. But, you know, it was um, uh, my uh, grandfather was a house painter. And all my uncles, they painted houses and just really good people, you know, uh, but didn't have very much. And I was sick all the time because all I ate was donuts and cinnamon toast. <laughs> I get sick, I get well, and I have, because they let me do what I wanted to do because, you know, I guess everybody, you know, felt sorry for me that uh, I lost my mother and my, my brother went, my older brother went to an orphanage. And so I got really into music. Uh, listening. My next door neighbor in North Memphis, Wayne Martin, uh, he was a year older, but he was listening to this new music, rhythm and blues, which was uh, not real popular in the 50s back in in Memphis. Uh, And it was pretty exciting stuff. And so I was listening to this show, Dewey Phillips, Red, Hot, and Blue. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I, I used to listen at nighttime. And uh, and when I was 12 years old, he played a record 
and to distinguish that it was a white art artist and not a black artist. He said, we're going to play this new record here uh, from a boy from Hume's High School. Well, all the schools were segreg segregated, so that meant that Elvis was not black because some people thought he kind of sounded because he was really doing black cover songs. And uh, I don't know. I was really into James Dean and Marlon Brando uh, filmically. And so the lights on the phone started blinking, people calling him, uh, according to Dewey, wanting to hear the song again. So... He contacted through Sam Phillips Sun Records, uh, Elvis's parents. Now Elvis knew they were playing the record that night, and he was so nervous. He went to a movie theater by himself. So they found him because Dewey wanted to interview him, and I don't know. He was just he was so cool. He stuttered a little bit, you know. It was so James Deanish, and uh, I said a little prayer that night as I went to bed, saying, "Hey, God, the neighborhood's not that big. I'd like to meet this boy from Hume's High." My mother had gone there. My cousins were still going there. I'm in grade school. Uh, I go to the local park the next day. Uh, and there's nothing there, basically, but dirt and horseshoes. And there were five older guys trying to get up a football game because nobody knew who Elvis was in person. It had only been on the radio. I think it was two nights at that time. And uh, one of the older guys, Red West, knew my older brother and said, Jerry, you want to play with us? And I come. Tried to be cool. I'm 12 years old. And I said, yeah, you know, and I walk over, you know, and we get in the huddle. There's three on each side. That's just as big a team Elvis could muster back then. And we get in the huddle, and I realized that my quarterback was the boy from Hume's High. And 70 years ago, July 11th, uh, is when Elvis and I became friends. And, wow. uh, yeah. So, um, and I still feel very much a part of the Presley family. Uh, they are my family, have been. Uh, you know, Scott, I lived at Graceland for 10 years. Uh, where I'm talking to you guys from today is, uh, 50 years ago is the home that Elvis bought me up in the Hollywood Hill. So um, <laughs> he's been a great landlord as well as a great friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I was explaining to Claire when I was telling her, you know, who we were having on today. Um, there was just a whole things, a lot of things that popped in my head. One is that you were in the photos of when Elvis met Nixon. So you've been right there at really all of Elvis's key moments in his career. You've been right there. You even drove. Isn't don't I remember correctly that you drove Elvis and Priscilla to the hospital when she had Lisa Marie? That's correct. And um, uh, in fact, Elvis called me. I was out here. And I had quit working. I quit working for him like two or three times, uh, only because I loved working for him. Uh, but I wanted to learn the business. And at this time, I was I went to get into film editing, and I was working in editing at Paramount Studios. And he called me to come back for Christmas, uh, and uh, so I went back for Christmas. Uh, had some days off and then he goes you're not staying for my birthday which was January 8th you know not too long after Christmas I said well let me let me call the studio I guess I am and then he I was all ready to go to the airport and he goes and for solicit there and he goes you're not staying for the birth of our child 
<laughs> so I was there until February 1st. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's been a nice, nice uh, history with Lisa. Uh, I was there the day she was born. Uh, uh, her first and only job, she worked for me at Jerry Schilling Management when I was uh, first time doing the Beach Boys and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. And then I became her manager uh, uh, her first time around uh, until Michael Jackson didn't, didn't want her to pursue a music career because they had just gotten married. And uh, he was very nice to meet with me to explain it because I'd worked very hard to get Lisa <laughs> uh, at the t yeah, at the time it was with CBS Records, Epic. It was the biggest new artist deal uh, that had been done, and you know you would think, okay, it's Lisa Marie Presley. It, it, it would be easy. No, it it isn't. An, it isn't a way to get you in the door, but the history of celebrities' children being successful. Film companies and record companies are very leery because it doesn't happen most of the time. So we we worked really hard on that, and then uh, ten years ago, uh, God, no, it was longer than that. Uh, I performed her wedding mm. uh, in Japan uh, to Michael Lockwood, and. Um, so it was a very beautiful wedding and whatever. And uh, more recently, uh, I, uh, and this was 10 years ago, I performed uh, Elvis's granddaughter, Lisa's daughter, Riley Keough's uh, wedding. Uh, and that's been 10 years. And uh, uh, very, very, very special to me, you know. Uh, uh, the world's getting to know Riley, uh, who is just a wonderful person, human being, talented, sweet. And uh, I, I, I guess I just wish that I hadn't lost my friend at such an early age because he yeah, had these great grandchildren, four, that he never, you know, met or saw. And, uh, you know, that's how life goes sometimes. Yeah, as I was telling Claire, you know, um, Elvis's brother died when he was born. You know, he was a twin, but that if he had had a brother, it would have been you, that you really functioned, you know, throughout his life as a brother and has, and you have continued to uh, all the way to this recent movie uh, where uh, Luke Bracey played you in Baz Luhrmann's Elvis that came out in 2022. I can't believe it's been that long already, but I know uh, what was it? What was it like to see yourself portrayed on the big screen? And also, what did you think of the film? Um, overall, I love the film. Uh, I think it, uh, it portrayed the history uh more so than any film has done before. Um, Austin Butler, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, various uh, actors playing Elvis. As you, as you remember, Scott, I used to be with Elvis Presley Enterprises officially uh, as creative affairs director. So films and music and stuff would come to me and then I'd bring it to the board, you know, to Jack and everybody. Uh, and you, <laughs> um, but, um, I was, uh, I met, we were on a promotion for the HBO, uh, special, the three hour special, um, Elvis, the searcher, which I was the executive producer on. And we were on a promotion tour and we ended up in New York at the Tribeca Film Festival. And um, I mean, we had done screening in Memphis and Nashville and South by South. 
I was really tired at the end of that. It was a great promotion tour. And I love that film too. Uh, it's a Tom Zimney film. So um, we finished the last interviews and screenings and everything. And Priscilla's going to leave early the next morning. I said, I'm, I'm sleeping in. I'm going to take another flight from New York back to L.A. So we're driving back to the hotel. And, you know, let's get a bite to eat, have a drink, you know, before you leave. Uh, I say to Priscilla. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me. And I get a call from Rob Santos. Do you remember him, Scott? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's with the record company and great guy and great friend. And and so I kind of whisper, I introduced Rob to Priscilla some years before. And I said, it's Rob Santos. And she said, come join us. I said, hey, Rob, uh, we're going to the hotel. You want to join us for a drink? And he said, sure. So we get there. And uh, to be honest, we have a couple of drinks or so. And uh, just a great night. And then Rob said, he, he said, Jerry, do you want to have dinner tomorrow? I said, Rob, I am dead. I said, I'm going to sleep in. I said, but you want to call me in the morning? And he said, sure. And Rob called me. I said, of course, let's have dinner. And he said, do you mind if I bring Bass Lorman? Now, this is five years ago, I guess. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> So me, uh, Rob, uh, Baz, and Skyler, who was a producer uh, uh, and works with uh, Baz very closely, we had about a four-hour dinner. And uh, Baz was still saying, you know, I may do this film. He'd been working on it for years. Baz is, a, uh, you know, he has his own style, which is great. And I really... Uh, uh, the little that I worked on the promotion tour, I really got to know him, and I, I think the world of him actually. So uh, from there, uh, they started. Oh, and then uh, we had a lunch here in L.A. Uh, Priscilla and I and Baz and Catherine Martin, his wife, who is also an Academy Award winning uh, producer. And we talked a lot about Colonel Parker. And uh, and then uh, this was all before filming started. And then um, Priscilla and I had dinner with Tom Hanks and his wife at, at their home. And I'll never forget, uh, for the audience, they may not know, but I, I managed the Beach Boys and I've done it for a lot of years. So... Obviously, we're going to talk about the film and about Colonel Parker. So Tom answers the door, you know, a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. So, Jerry, are we going to talk about the Beach Boys or Elvis? <laughs> and that was the first thing he said to me. <laughs> and, and we had a great talk. And then, you know, he went to, he went to Australia. And then that's when a, a week or so later, he came out publicly that he had COVID. I went, oh, my God. I remember that. Yeah. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, but I give him a lot of credit that he went public. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that was important for the pandemic and for people being honest, you know, and saying, hey, look, I, I got sick and I'm going to isolate myself or whatever. So the film was delayed there, whatever. And then it was like, I didn't hear, they stayed in Australia, and both um, Austin Butler and Tom Hank, uh, I, I went to the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, Baz asked me if uh, I would go uh, for the promotion of the film. And, uh, and then he said, you know, uh, maybe you want to ask Priscilla, and through a whole series of events uh i convinced priscilla that she could go she should go but if she didn't want to i was going to go anyway because i had a good feeling about the film and uh and i know we always for years and years and years and years <laughs> talked about 
the the movie and a movie and you know the ultimate Elvis you know biopic and so yeah I know there must have been excitement and also a little trepidation of how is this going to turn out. It, it was a little of both because you know Bass has his own style, uh, and it's somewhat flamboyant in a great creative way. But it kind of goes with Elvis, you know. After you see the film and the whole, it 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 just the stars uh, were in alignment for this. So we're getting ready to go to the Cannes Film Festival in France, and uh, I get a call from Warner Brothers. Priscilla and I had our uh, commercial reservations and everything, and I get a call from Warner Brothers saying. Hey, and we were leaving the next day. Jerry, would uh, you and Priscilla like to go on the Warner Brothers jet? And I said, well, yeah. That way we didn't have to go through London, change planes to go south of France. And um, so we get to the airport uh, the night before uh, that I got the phone call the night after. And... You know, I'm thinking, okay, there's going to be 15 people or whatever on that. There were four people on the plane. (laughs) There was Tom Hanks, Austin Butler, facing two seats, Priscilla and me. Wow. So so we talked about the film for 12 hours. We slept a little bit, too. It was was the the greatest trip. Uh, I'll never forget it. And... uh, you know, we did the promotion. We did the Met Gala in New York, which is, I mean, think about me coming from poor North Memphis. And there's all these <laughs> super wealthy people at the Metropolitan Gala in New York. I'm thinking, oh, my God. So uh, uh, it, it was just um, every, everything was, was pretty pretty magical. But through this whole process, as opposed to Elvis and Nixon, which was uh, a feature film as well, uh, that my character, uh, Alex Pettifor, was the second character in the film. Uh, Michael Shannon played Elvis, Alex Pettifor played me, and Kevin Spacey played Richard Nixon. I don't know if you saw that film. Oh, yes, yes. No, I did. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I worked every day on that film. Uh, I uh, uh, Michael Shannon said, "If I take this, he knew he was miscast looking. He's a great actor and a great guy." We went to Memphis and did research and everything. Mm-hmm. And he said, "If I do this film, will you be on location?" And it was shot in New Orleans. And I said. If the director thinks it's cool, and it, it, it really worked out nice. So, um, but it was totally opposite on Elvis, the Baz Luhrmann film. Uh, I never met Luke Bracey. Hmm. And uh, I saw him on a red carpet in London. They had a big screening there. And uh, he was signing autographs, and one of the uh, people said, "How, uh, Luke, how did you feel playing Jerry Sewing? He said, well, I was really honored. He said, I've sent him a couple of emails. I haven't, he hasn't gotten back yet. So I call Warner Brothers. <laughs> I get his, his email. I send him a couple of emails. Uh, evidently, I don't know, he didn't get them. I know now. So... I go to the Academy Awards, first time I've ever been. And, uh, you know, uh, Elvis was up for eight Academy Awards. And um, so I'm at the show. And then Warner Brothers has a big party. In the meantime, Baz Luhrmann emailed me a couple of times. And he said, Jerry, I think you're going to be very happy of how Luke Bracey plays you. Uh he said, I think it's very respectful. And he was updating me. So we go to the party after the Academy Awards, uh, Cindy and I, 
And this guy walks up, says, hey, I'm Luke. <laughs> and uh, so we had a great night talking, meeting him, Austin Butler, all of us. And then Luke and I have um, gone to dinner out here in West Hollywood and become friends. And he's just a wonderful guy. Uh, the people that Bass chose on this film, uh, they were all special in their different ways. Uh, I mean, very, very, very special. Uh, uh, it was one of those magical people came together and because they went through so much trauma with COVID, and then after that, they started to film and they built all these sets and there was the big Australian fires. Mm -hmm. And then that set them back. But on that flight uh, to the Cannes Film Festival, both Tom and Austin said, because of that off time and all of us still together, whatever, it really made the project special. I mean, Austin Butler didn't do anything for, I guess, three years, but the Elvis Presley. And, so, and, and it, for, for me, so when I watched it, you know, I've heard lots of stories and I've, you know, and so as I've sat through many, many conversations on Elvis as the, you know, many cruise ships where we had speakers, yep. yourself included, and, and the Imperials and the sweet inspiration, you know, I've heard the stories. And so I had in my head, but what I actually saw um, played out on screen really resonated and matched well what I had heard all those years. Did you have a similar feeling since you actually were in it all those years? Yes. I mean, I felt it answered uh, uh, some questions, too, without hitting people over the head. Uh, I, I think the acceptance in the black community of Elvis, certainly in the beginning, I think his respect... Uh, and admiration for black artists and then country artists and certainly gospel and everything. I think I covered all of that, um, you know, very well. That was very important to me. Um, I understand a bit about filmmaking and um, I understand that you have to have a protagonist. And I knew that was going to be the colonel. And um, I did everything I could uh, with Baz, with Tom, uh, to show both sides of the colonel. The colonel is a very easy to go to bad guy. Uh, I remember when I didn't like him, <laughs> uh, when I first went to work for Elvis, but he would put you through these things. Um, I, I can say this, uh, I think the film had to do what it did. Well, and um, that was, that's actually in my notes. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was to share your favorite Colonel Parker story in real life, because for most people, Colonel Parker is just, you know, this, this thing that is in some ways made up to, as you said, be the bad guy, but. You know, do you have any, because I love the whole Colonel Parker stories and the collection that they have at Graceland of Colonel Parker's things. And, you know, uh, that's an element of Elvis's story that I've always been particularly fascinated with. You have an, a Colonel Parker story for us? Well, I have years. Um, <laughs> as Loanna's wife said, I was the closest person to him the last 20 years of his life. Uh, I, um, I, uh, so. No, okay. I had, um, I actually, my wife and I had gone to uh, Vegas to have dinner. Uh, it's been two or three days with the colonel and, and low end. This is after Elvis had passed away, uh, we kept a relationship. Colonel felt close to me because at this point, I'm a manager of Jerry Lee Lewis and the Beach Boys. So he always said, you know, you and I can talk, you're a manager. Uh and, you know, 
uh, from him not speaking to me for the first year. And I thought, okay, next time I see him on the set, I'm not speaking to him. <laughs> and, we, and we passed by and he goes, good morning, Jerry. It's all a psychological thing. Um, uh, you know, and then years later, and uh, I was a loan out to Colonel Parker from Elvis uh, during the movies one day a week. And I'd work in Colonel's office and through osmosis, I guess I picked up on a lot of stuff. And then a lot of weekends I would drive Colonel. He, he lived in Palm Springs mostly, but he lived here in LA uh, during the week when Elvis was filming. And then on Friday afternoon, I would drive him to Palm Springs and then maybe go back and pick him up Monday morning or there were sometimes I just stayed there with him and, and spent the night at the house. And, uh, uh, I found, uh, I found him one of the most interesting, colorful, uh, human beings that, um, I've ever come in contact with. I mean, there's, there's three geniuses, uh, for me, starting with Elvis. Then there was Sam Phillips. And I was friends and produced an A and E documentary on Sam. Um, then there was Colonel Parker, and now uh, I'd like to add Baz Luhrmann to that list, uh, my humble list of geniuses. And and, and I want to add I want to add Jack Soden. To Jack that. Soden is the heart and soul of Graceland. Uh, of after Elvis, great choice, Priscilla, but Jack Soden, uh, everybody's replaceable. But I don't know how Jack Soden could ever be replaceable. Uh, you know, and when people ask me about my years there, and I will tell them, you know, without both the decisions that Jack and Priscilla made early on with no rudder necessarily and nobody who had done it before, the two of them together were an unbeatable duo. And I don't know that people would still be enjoying as much of Elvis today if they hadn't have done what they did back when they had some key decisions to make in Graceland's very early history as a destination. Scott, you're so right on. Uh, and they had to make the hard decisions. And I know that the, the word on the street in Memphis was uh, when Priscilla was making the decision and, and to bring in Jack and uh, this won't last six months. Because unfortunately, when my friend passed away, you know, it wasn't at a very peak time of his career. It was a rough time in his life. And, you know, thank God his history and his love and his body of work uh, shone through. But, you know, I get asked a lot of times, Scott, why Elvis Presley, as an artist, is, is you know, so big and I go well and there are other artists you know not to compare because you can't uh, you can but <laughs> may not be a fair comparison but no matter how great the artist is if they left the body of work which Elvis left both filmically and certainly musically, body of work. Uh, and I know other artists uh, that have their own body of work, big names, Rat Pack, whatever, music body of work. Uh, and, and they're being worked somewhat. But if there is not an Elvis Presley Enterprises, a Jack Sheldon, a Scott Williams, uh, people uh, today like uh, uh, Alicia Dean and Angie and you know uh, if you don't utilize that body of work and if you don't have a record company 
putting together new juxtapositions of albums and new artwork and new behind the scenes liner notes, new films, new like what we've been talking about, Baz Lorman. No matter how great they are they will be not totally forgotten, but they won't be on the mainstream as Elvis is. And that did start with Jack and Priscilla. I yep. mean, Priscilla, Priscilla cared so much. I remember her calling, you know, what do you think? You know, Elvis loves showing the house. And I you know, it was a financial crisis and uh, uh, they couldn't pay the taxes. And what about if we opened it? And, I remember one day she called me. She said, I'm up in the attic, and I found the original white carpet, because it was red carpet uh, at the point. I think Linda had, had put the red carpet in at that point, mm -hmm. Linda Thompson. So don't you think it should go back? I mean, that, she's up in the attic looking at carpet, how much you know care went into you know opening up Graceland. Um, but... It's 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 a multi, as you know, Scott, job that Jack does. You need to be a politician in Memphis uh, to have a business like Graceland. Uh, you need, first of all, to have a relationship with the family. You need to have a relationship with the fans. Uh, Jack has all of that and he does it so quietly right and so professionally i um you know i i don't know uh we talk fairly often just just, just hearing his voice is uh you know it, it, i just feel good when i talk to jack my my favorite Jack story is we were going into a big New York muckety muck thing. I don't even know what uh -huh. it was. I was probably fourteen years old, and he leans over and whispers, "Just act like you've been here before." And so <laughs> that was his that was his big advice. So it was great. I mean, so many times, yeah. still to this day, a week doesn't go by that I don't hear something it from Jack in my head. While I'm trying to guide this ship that is Discovery Park, you know, Jack had some great insights. And after years of, you know, doing some amazing things was just absolute brilliant to get to learn from. So one of my biggest things I'm grateful for in life. You knew Jack when you were 14? No, probably. I was mentally 14. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, <laughs> uh, I have. Jack and I reminisce on this story a lot. So way back, uh, there was uh, it was an Elvis week, and there was some function at the Peabody Hotel. Uh, I think you were involved at the time, and uh, so I'm I'm on the board uh, as creative affairs director of Elvis Presley Enterprises. I work for Jack. <laughs> bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. So. We're there. I, 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 there's a tribute artist or something on stage uh, at the Peabody. And these two girls walk up and they go, Jerry, can we have your autograph? And I said, well, sure. And so I sign. And, uh, then they ask Jack for his autograph. And Jack graciously. And, and then they said to Jack, uh, who are you? And, <laughs> and Jack says, well, why did you want my <laughs> autograph? And they said, well, you were with Jerry Schilling, and we <laughs> thought you must be important. I'm working <laughs> for Jack. I, and, and he and I, oh, I guess once a year we laugh about that. Uh, that's great. Before we get out of here, I want to give Claire a chance to ask a question. So, Claire, I know you have to know an Elvis movie. What is your favorite Elvis movie? It's got to be 68 Special. Okay, great. So, Jerry, give us a story about 68 Special. I know you were right there the whole time. Well, 68 Special, um, Elvis was so nervous about because he finished his contracts with the movies, and some of the movies... Uh, 
you know, we're a little beneath his his uh, expertise, if you will. Some of them were great, uh, but he just wanted to get back on the road. Uh, he needed two things. He needed hit records, and I think, um, oh, American Studios, Chip Moment, uh, helped him get that, uh, thanks to George Klein, who suggested to Memphis, we were sitting at the dinner table at Graceland, you know, Elvis, why don't you record in Memphis? Neil Diamond was everybody. It was really a hot place at the time. And to everybody's surprise, Elvis said, okay. Uh, so uh, the other thing was, okay, he, he had a, you know, the record started coming out. and But the biggest thing was, how would he be accepted as a performer after all these years not performing? Uh, uh, you know, close to a decade with a couple exceptions. And I mean, you know, he was a nervous wreck. Uh, and I think the highlight for me is Elvis was not a songwriter. And they wanted to do an interview for the 68 special. And either Colonel or Elvis, it, it, it didn't happen. So they wanted to do this song. And Earl Brown, the writer of If I Could Dream, he sat with Elvis for, I don't know, two and a half hours, uh, went home and wrote If I Could Dream. And Elvis performed it. And I think that uh, is the highlight. I think that could be uh, the song for hope for the world today. It still holds up, you know, where all my brothers can walk hand in hand. So, Claire, that's a great, a, a great choice. Uh, uh, 68 special. Uh, I'm working on a... Uh, um, a, a potential Netflix thing, uh, read the 68 special. So, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, that probably may come out at the beginning of the year. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying more than I should, but anyway. But well, we, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So, um, <laughs> last question. I don't I want to take up all your time. Last question. You said you were getting ready to go to Elvis week. You and I have both together been through many, many Elvis weeks. You know, a lot of people won't or can't understand who haven't been what Elvis week is. What, how do you share? How do you tell people what Elvis week is all about? Well, you know, I was kind of one of those people, you know, after the first two or three years of uh, losing Elvis, I didn't go back, you know, uh, and I don't go every year. Uh, and then I went back and you have to be there to experience it, that there is so much love, fun from around the world uh, that shared during that week. There's special personal moments like the candlelight vigil. I mean, how personal can you get with thousands of people? But it is a personal moment. There's, you know, uh, seminars that are, you know, with the people uh, that worked with Elvis, either on stage or uh, like me, you know, uh, if you will, Memphis Mafia guy. Uh, but there's all these insights, love, uh, and, you know, I didn't think I'd really want to go to the candlelight vigil. Uh, it was years before I went, and I really get it. Uh, it's, it, it's something that, if you love music in general, if you love El you just you just have to experience it. And uh there's so much camaraderie. Uh there's so much I don't know, the 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 
word that comes to me is just love. And uh, there's a lot of fun too. And uh, yeah, that's a great know, answer. That's a great answer for me. What what I always try to tell people, camaraderie is a great word. Is you know, it's really is about the people. You you yes, you will make friends. You know, I still have friends and it's been, you know, it's been, you know, almost 15 years since I was there. I still have friends on Facebook and friends I see in Memphis that I made, you know, that we met through Elvis week. And the fact that Elvis week began, you know, were you by chance around that very first time when the fans gathered on the anniversary of Elvis's death and Vernon said, open the gates and let them in? You know, that's how it started, you know, was. Well, I, 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 I was there when when Elvis was uh, resting in peace uh, at Graceland and Vernon said, you know, I want the fans to be able to come by and pay their respects. Yeah. I was a pallbearer. And yeah. yes, uh, it was ironic. It was the first day I had been a tour manager for the Beach Boys and had left Elvis, gone back to whatever. And it was the first day that I was to be manager of the Beach Boys, uh, full manager. And I got a call. I don't know if you know this uh, name, Scott, but uh, Patty Perry. Oh, sure. A, yeah. And she was hysterical. I was just finishing up all my paperwork, and I walked out on the balcony here. I mean, I was... I, 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 the phone rang and I just said, you know, I'm not going to take another. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll pick it up. And I couldn't hardly. And she said, Elvis is gone. I didn't say anything. We'd been in a drought out here in California for three years. I walked out on my balcony, which is where Elvis told me why he gave me the phone. And it started raining. And, uh, then, um, I got a call from Priscilla, said, meet me at the airport. Uh, Vernon sending the Lisa Marie back. And um, I was there, and it was, um, I think we were all so much in shock, and there was so much responsibility. And God bless Vernon for wanting, for caring that much about the fans with his grief that he suggested that. And uh, uh, then I had to leave and go to New York to catch up with the Beach Boys. And I know we'll forget, uh, Carl Wilson and his wife said, do you want to come over to our room? And I went over and um, he said, how are you doing? And that's, the first time I realized that I'd never see Elvis Presley again. Mm, yeah. And I hit the wall. I broke my hand. And mm. it, it was it was like I, I had the first time to really realize I'd seen him all the time since I was 12 years old. Mm. You know, he was, you know, always there. Always, you know. So, but he's still always there. And Elvis Week... And projects that I get blessed to work on and be a part of. And, uh, you know, Scott, I can't tell you how proud I am that I'm part of Elvis's history. And I mean that very humbly. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's so much what my life. And it's, it's continue. It continues. It continues to grow. You know, people have asked me, well, aren't all the Elvis fans quote unquote dying out? And, uh, you know, actually I know from having worked there that every year there are new and, you know, new fans created new people discovering Elvis. And, you know, there are many, many people going to Elvis week for the very first time. My favorite Elvis week story is a dad walked up to me with two twin boys that looked to be about 10 years old. And he said, uh, -huh. uh what are you guys doing to my kids? And I was like, uh, <laughs> what do you mean? And he said, my wife and I are not fans of Elvis at all, but my two twins love Elvis. And the only thing they wanted for their birthday was a trip to Elvis week. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's amazing, 
you know, that all of us that have worked in the Elvis world, uh, including people that we didn't mention yet, like Todd Morgan, oh my Paul, God. you know, the list goes on and on of all the people, you know, who've had, just like us have had a little tiny, um, you know, finger in it and have loved, uh, yes, you know, the fans and, and of course all the many fans. So anyway, all of us will continue, you know, to pass on and, but, but the Elvis, uh, body of work will continue. And I believe people will continue to go to Graceland to celebrate Elvis for hundreds of years to come. So lots yeah. for them to look forward to. Well, I'd like to end with the Jack Soden quote, please. Uh, uh, and, you know, we've all become so important. And, you know, and I mean that in a light way in the Elvis world. Some people maybe become more important than they really were. But <laughs> anyway, and Jack will every once in a while with these conversations going on, and he goes, you know, I always thought it was all about Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a great, that, that, that's just kind of who Jack loves this. Yep, absolutely. Hey, Jerry, thank you so much. For anybody who wants to learn more about Jerry, you have a book um, yep. that is um, called, I wrote it down, I want to make sure, Me and a Guy Named Elvis, so you can yeah. uh, Google it. And then yeah. you'll be, you're going to Elvis Week. Are you at any of the events? Well, I'm going for the events. Uh, I'm going to do uh, a couple of, late night uh private tours okay uh through graceland uh, nice i i've i've done that a couple of times i'm doing a uh, a talk with tom brown at uh uh just in general like what we're doing here yeah uh at the guest house uh at the theater at the guest house and then they're doing a new thing this year it's a uh, fan awards uh were the best fans in certain areas and uh i uh have been asked to present a couple of awards which i'm uh you know uh, proud to do so uh, i'm really looking forward to it and uh i get to see my family um my brother turns 90 years old on august 16th so uh it's I, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh God, I wish you were back there. Are you coming back, Scott? You know what? I, I have to look. I don't sometimes I do go, you know, I've judged the uh uh ETA contest before and I come up there for candlelight visual sometimes and I need to. I'm gonna have to look at my calendar. Um it's nothing like it. I love the candlelight vigil where the people are out making little sculptures and chalk drawings on the street and you know, I just I love that whole vibe. So you you may find me there. I'll give you a shout if I do. Okay, great. I last year I was there and it was such a great night. I remember walking from the gates back up to Graceland uh with Jack Leanne, uh Joel Weinschenker, his wife Kim, uh and myself and Cindy. And it was just such a nice feeling of quietness. I mean, Graceland is the home of rock and roll, but it's the most peaceful uh, place I've ever lived in my life. But it still yeah, there's has nothing. There's nothing like it. You you cannot you cannot explain or describe or record what the sound is of Elvis Week on Candlelight Vigil Night about three o'clock in the morning. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, nothing like it. All right, Scott, it's been a real pleasure. So Claire, much fun. Come see I, us. Come see us Claire, at Discovery I I, Park. Oh, I'd love to. And I think you're doing great stuff from what I read. And uh, Claire, I hope I didn't bore you. Oh, no, uh, not at no, I was <laughs> Absolutely fascinated. You've taught me a lot. And I'm, you know, a little bit, I'm not a naturally big Elvis fan, but now I am. So <laughs> thank oh, you. Okay. Mission accomplished. Thank you, Jerry. After the break, we're going to check in with Alicia Dean, who is at Graceland right now, getting ready for Elvis Week 2024. For many, the Hatchie River is a restorative sanctuary and a place to feel connected to something larger than ourselves. The Hatchie River Conservancy is working to conserve and sustain the river's natural integrity and scenic beauty for generations to come. For more information on how you can help, visit HatchieRiver.org. 
I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams. We've been discussing Elvis and and his life with Jerry Schilling. Our next guest is Alicia Dean, Marketing, Promotions, and event Specialist at Elvis Presley Enterprises, and I would like to say a very good friend of mine. Welcome, Alicia. So, Alicia Dean, you are talking to us from Graceland, where Elvis Week planning is underway. Of course, you and I have planned many Elvis Weeks together. What (laughs) number are you on right now? Personally, I am on Elvis Week number 18. Can you believe that? (laughs) What? (laughs) I cannot yeah. believe that. Yeah, because I started in um, what was it, June two thousand seven. I remember yeah. your very first one. It was the thirtieth anniversary. That's yep. when I first started. Yeah, it was probably the most wild, probably still to this day, the most wild Elvis week I've ever had. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's something about Elvis week. Jerry Schilling and I were just talking, and we were. Ta- there's a few things when I think of Elvis week personally. There's a few things I think about. One is the sound of the candlelight vigil about three o'clock in the morning when you're up on the hill. Right. There, you won't hear that sound anywhere else in the world. Right. Um, and then also just the pure exhaustion. Of uh, having put it on, <laughs> right. and I remember one time, like I was so tired, I just laid down on the street, <laughs> on Elvis Presley Boulevard. And well, at one time, maybe it was 2007. We had a like a what is it, an air mattress in the closet here uh, in our right. offices. We were so tired that we, we literally were all taking worked turns taking naps. <laughs> we worked literally, I would say, five days. Mm-hmm. without ever leaving i mean we yeah. were seriously there with and there you're right there we would just take turns we had a little schedule and we would lay down yeah in the closet close the door and go to sleep for just grab some sleep as quick as we could isn't that crazy to think about like this is this is like work like this is actually what we do <laughs> right right no it's so much fun and you know i mean you also what what are your thoughts on uh w- why is Elvis week a thing? You know, Jerry and I discussed that a little bit. What, what, what are your thoughts on why do people gather for Elvis week? You know, I, I love this question because it actually stumps me every time someone asks, cause it's all kind of in the same realm as why is Elvis still so popular? Why, what is it about Elvis that people are drawn to? And again, the answer is kind of up in the air still. I mean, there's so many different things that attract people to Elvis. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, Elvis is such a generational thing. Like it's such a, um, something that pulls at your heartstrings. It doesn't matter if, you know, you fell in love with Elvis because your mom loved Elvis. Um, if your grandparents loved Elvis, if you heard, you know, Elvis on the radio, there's something about it that's nostalgic. And I think people love nostalgia because it ties them back to a memory of some sort. And I think that that's truthfully a reason why, you know, people love Elvis. And not only that is, you know, again, we're unlike anywhere else in the world because we actually have a place you can visit. We have a a tangible location. If you think about you know, oh, someone being a Beatles fan, where do they go? I mean, someone to be a fan of Michael Jackson, well, where do they go? I mean, the only other place that you can say that is really about Prince and Paisley Park. And, you know, we obviously had a hand in that a couple of years ago, but it doesn't have the same, the same type of feel. But I think it's just because of you know, the the time and the nature of Elvis, he hit all of the amazing uh, time periods, right? Again, going back to nostalgia, you know, he hit the 50s. People have that amazing, like a uh, time capsule feeling about the 50s. And then you've got the 60s again, people of the 60s, and then you get the decade of the 70s. So I don't know. It's a question that literally could be a great debate for hours and hours and then it will be a great debate for years to come that sounds like a good elvis week event Um, (laughs) yeah exactly so um my first elvis week and somewhere there's a videotape of it i've looked for it many times but i can't seem to find it but somewhere there's a vhs tape that i made when i was early college Uh of of a candlelight vigil and you know the across the street was still the old 
stores and shops right. that were there. And Todd Morgan was up there talking about, he was given the rules and the guidelines for candlelight right. vigil and that's on the tape. And anyway, so, so two questions, what was your first Elvis week that you remember? And then what, how's it changed for you through the years since those very early days? Personally, the first Elvis week I remember, I actually, my mom is a huge Elvis fan. Um, and she took us to, do you remember the concert that I believe was at the pyramid that had mm -hmm. all the celebrities? It was yeah, uh, sure, achy, like, breaky, achy, breaky heart. Yeah. Guy was yeah. There. I'm pretty sure like, was like Ellen DeGeneres there. Maybe Michael Jackson. I, I Billy can't remember. Ray Cyrus. Okay. Yeah. He performed, I, mean, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think my mom took me to that. The very first, that was the first Elvis week I remember, but then going into you know, working here in 2007, uh, this was my first job out of college. So I had no clue <laughs> what to expect. Even being a Memphian, I had no idea what this, what this place was about. And, you know, again, had never been to a candlelight vigil before until that year. And I don't know if you remember Scott that year, we actually, um, had to shut down the candlelight vigil because people were, they were still queuing, you know, up to the meditation garden at like eight in the morning and we had to run tours. And I don't know that that's ever happened before. And that was really absolutely incredible. I remember leaving that night with uh, Kevin Kern, who was, you know, my, my other boss at the time going, okay, well, we've got to be back for live news hits at like four in the morning and coming back. It, nothing had changed. It was like you left at 8 p.m., came back at 4 a.m., and it was the exact same amount of people. They were doing the exact same thing. Like it was wild. Like I've never seen that many people in one place unless you're at like a massive music festival. And that's kind of what <laughs> kind of what it is to a point. Well, and for people who have never been there before, people also make like little chalk drawings or wax drawings or, mm -hmm. you know, there's all this creativity that happens yeah. along the street and the street gets closed down. And, yeah. uh, you know, there, and that's the other, you know, when you think about sounds, that's the other sound that there's really nothing like it across the street during candlelight vigil when you're just kind of like especially like when you're like in your shoes and the the main work is done, you've got everybody there. And then for just one second, you can take a breather yeah. and observe, you know? And so it really is a moving experience. Uh, for me, it was every single year. And yeah. And it still is. I have that same emotion because you're right. You're able to kind of stop and, and really look at the people who are there and kind of take in you're and you're proud of it too. You're like, this is, this is what we work for. And you're proud that people are still coming and, you know, paying their tribute to Elvis and paying their respects. And they make, yeah, like those little shrines in the street, they bring their chairs and for the fans, it's, it's the camaraderie. It's like they're coming to meet up with their friends that they met, you know, through Elvis. And it, it's a, Really, really special thing and again it's it's a lot of times for me hard to put it into words because again everybody has a different story and everybody has an Elvis story um and that's a unique thing in itself I mean you know we've traveled all over the world and you know you can remember all the places that you traveled and you'd say you work for Elvis and you work at Graceland and people go oh my gosh number one how cool number two let me tell you my Elvis story I right. mean like where, where else, you know, who else could you say that you have that same kind of, you know, connection with with people literally all around the world? It's impossible. <laughs> and the music, the music superstars who would come to Graceland oh, yeah. and have such a such a uh, opinion of humility and they would see the gold records. And, you know, I can't remember one of some music person, you know, like turned to me and said, um, you don't understand what it takes to get this many gold records. You know, right. I mean, this person was just freaked out. Yeah. You know, um, I remember Elvis Costello saying, mm -hmm. uh, you've got the coolest job. You know, so, <laughs> that's you know, yeah, that's the thing. Everybody says that you have the coolest job. You know, those people and, are always in awe yeah. of yeah. Elvis and most of them are Elvis fans. You and know, now so. we have um, our icons exhibit, which is the display of, you know, tons of different, you know, superstars today. Um, you know, we have everybody from 
uh, Kiss to Kid Rock to The Rock <laughs> to Elton mm-hmm. John to Carrie Underwood to Dolly, all represented in this um, museum. And what's interesting is talking about people coming to tour now. You name it, the celebrities, the musicians, they'll go, how do I get in here? Like, what can I give you something like right now? They're going, <laughs> what, can I, what can I get off my tour bus? Because, you know, we do um, we do a lot of concerts here now. We um, work with Live Nation on booking in, you know, acts to play at our soundstage. And a lot of the times the artists tour. And when they tour, they go, wait a minute. I'm a huge Elvis fan. How do I get on display here? So it's pretty cool. It's a pretty, pretty unique experience. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's amazing. So do you think that coming off of the uh, Elvis movie, you're going to have people who discovered they were Elvis fans while they watched the movie and are coming to Elvis week this year to celebrate? You know, I think so. I think we're still seeing the, uh, the, the ripple effect from the movie for sure, because, you know, I guess just in terms of uh, how people choose to travel, um, it wasn't like, you know, there were a few people probably across the world that saw the movie and was like, let's go to Graceland. But, you know, not everybody that saw the movie. I mean, gosh, it was such a, you know, highly attended flick and it still is people are still watching it on airplanes and people you know it was on hbo hbo max forever but you know i i I definitely believe that we are still seeing the residual effects from that movie and i can tell you something that shocked me because we kind of knew like you know baz lerman anything just turns to gold and warner brothers being such a huge 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 force in you know film we're like this is definitely going to be successful but what i didn't foresee happening was how it would affect kids and i say that because we run a graceland performing arts camp and i so wish you could come and experience this because it's first of all when we started it in 2018 we didn't know what we were doing you know we're going okay we're a marketing department you get tossed you know something to work on and you just kind of have to figure it out and so we run a camp that's uh you know four day camp that where kids come to, you know, learn singing, acting and dancing and, you know, obviously incorporating some Elvis into it. Um, And when we first started, we only had like, I don't know, 30 campers. We kind of grew it to 40 campers and we're going, this is great. Um, And we were hoping, you know, okay, well, we'll we'll just kind of grow this over time. Well, that Elvis movie came out and we completely doubled our numbers and we didn't have to spend a dime in marketing. Um, it was because of that movie that it affected kids. And I'm talking ages six to 17. And that's something I was not expecting the movie to do was to hit kids of that age. Like I expected, you know, people in their thirties and people in their, you know, early forties, but not that kind of transformation to literally show itself going, okay, these kids, they're Elvis fans and they want to come to Graceland. Like it's, it's fascinating. So we get to see a lot of these parents who that's why I bring up, you know, the whole generational, you pass down Elvis. And that's exactly what we see, um, you know, within, within the camp. So it's quite interesting. Well, I'm, I'm ready for the spinoff movie about you, Carla and Jen. (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure who's going to play each of you, but I'm really looking forward to that one. But, well, I tried to get them to join our conversation today, but well, you know, somebody has got to carry the torch and get, the I'm telling up, so. you, they need to get it, get it there and talk. Um, but, but that is the other thing that Jerry and I discussed is that, is that Graceland and Elvis and, you know, it is a big, huge company, but it's also really about the people that you get to meet. Like, you know, when you go to Graceland, you know, I know Regina Gamble and Jamie Gamble. I mean, they've been there for, for decades now, I guess, right, for, right, yeah. for a long, long time. And their family, right. they're both, they are family members, but mm-hmm. them and a lot of the other people that work there really do feel like family members to the fans who come every year, year after year after year. And you do develop these relationships and these friendships. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, about what that means to you. Yeah, you're exactly right. And you know, that's actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's 100% factual. Um, I, I will never forget because again, I started in 2007 and I was an intern. I did not have any, um, you know, I wasn't hired full time. Uh, I thought, OK, well, I'm only going to be here through September of 2007. And I'll never forget, like having a, you know, going away lunch per se. And I was so sad to leave. 
I like went out into the parking lot and cried. I was like, I don't know why I'm so sad. And then it just kind of hit me like, I'm going to miss these people. Like it's something, it was something about like the people and like feeling like your family here. And that's so true. Um, And then I guess it's to say it was meant to be because here I am 17 years later, um, not even having the full time uh, job at the very beginning. But yeah, it is like a family, like you said, I mean, And also to speak on the fact that, yeah, I've been here for 17 years because you feel like it's family. Everybody who comes, I say everybody, for the most part, that comes to work here, you end up staying for a long time. I mean, there's a there's a nice, you know, percentage of people who are employees here that, you know, have been here for, you know, 20, 25, 30, 35, you know, 40 years. And where do you see that today? Like, where do you find that? And, you know, and again, we're not corporate we are, but we're not, you know, I mean, right. like you said, we're, a, we're, we're a small, you know, company. Um, and even though, you know, we work, you know, into the wee hours of the morning and all sorts of kind of crazy things, we keep coming back for more. And it's, you know, it's a combination of feeling like, okay, we have this sense of responsibility um, to not only take care of Elvis and, you know, take care of his legacy, but also to take care of the fans and to, take care of our family. We're all, we all have each other's backs and it's such a, it's such a rare and unique thing, but yeah, it's, it's definitely the reason that I didn't want to leave when I first started working here. So it's very important. So speaking of family at our, at our family, every Christmas, we have this thing that we call Alicia Dean's mother's Elvis wheat casserole, um, which is (laughs) actually pineapple casserole casserole (laughs) because every, every Elvis week, I don't know if she still does, but every Elvis week she does. she would bring mm-hmm. breakfast yep. and that pine. That's the first time I ever had pineapple casserole and she <laughs> yeah. will, um, she would bring it. And so we now make it and it's Alicia Dean's mother's Elvis sweet casserole that that's we have at Christmas. So, so. funny. I thought you were going to talk about making us uh, make ornaments at the Christmas party every year. At your house. <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are uh, teammates that I've worked with in the years since that all know about making handmade <laughs> ornaments at, at, for my house every Christmas. And so my tree is now filled with handmade ornaments, you know, See, from I'm my so glad teammates. you did that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so any, anything coming up that you can share with us, um, for, um, the Elvis Presley brand of work, any new releases coming up we need to know about or mm. anything like that for us Elvis fans. Oh yeah, there's there's some new stuff. When when does this come out? Like when are you publishing this? Uh next week. <laughs> Ooh, next week. Well, there's nothing I can um okay, yeah, I figured, you know, that mm. a lot of stuff stays under actually, wraps until we have, time. A, we have a really cool announcement that'll take place during Elf Week. Oh um, my goodness. Okay. That I, I that I can't wait to tell you about and you're gonna go, y'all are nuts. <laughs> okay. But the I hope I hope and I think the fans will love it. Um it's uh oh i wish i could talk about it i'll tell you what i'll do is if if the release has come out on the day that we released this episode i'll put a link to the to the information in the show notes okay well i'm telling we'll we'll announce it on the 15th so okay um, so, uh, that, that that that's your that's your teaser how about okay. that okay sounds fantastic and everybody can google 15th. uh or you can just go to graceland.com yeah um and you know the other thing i did want to throw out there for people who are listening who really don't know that much about elvis or graceland um because there's a lot of people who listen who are from a lot of other places and so uh one thing if you go to graceland you absolutely should stay at the hotel that's there Mm -hmm. um i've stayed there many times and uh you guys were kind enough to ask me to be a judge at the tribute artist contest a couple (laughs) years ago and i got to stay there and you know i was thinking when i went there i bet the pool's going to be crowded so I better get down there and get a little seat. But what I <laughs> what I realize is people don't go to Graceland in Memphis to sit by the pool. And so I was the only one at the pool, you right. know, because everybody was out at the Elvis Week event. So yeah, um, we keep we keep people pretty busy during Elvis Week. <laughs> so describe the hotel back. for anybody who's not familiar with it, because it's it's not just a hotel; it is a whole experience. It is. It's a. It's definitely a resort 
hotel that is steps away from the mansion and it is a 450 room beautiful hotel i mean truly you don't feel like you're in memphis in my opinion but like you said the beautiful beautiful pool in the back i mean when you walk into the back of the hotel it's just this beautiful like green space which, where we actually do events um we're actually having a luau during all this week back there um that'll be really cool and then you know the pool's kind of hidden behind it it's and it's so serene like it's so quiet the hotel just kind of like builds this like beautiful wall to where again you have no clue you're on elvis presley boulevard right um but it's just this gorgeous hotel that again one of the one of the interesting notes about it people always say something to me and they go why don't we see elvis in this hotel like you don't really face in the decor and the rooms and that's because I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, Elvis actually wanted to build a guest house. That's the name of our hotel, the guest house at Graceland. Um, Elvis wanted to build a guest house because Graceland wasn't big enough. Um, and he there were people that were, you know, constantly coming into town. He had to put them up at the Howard Johnson. Um, I'm sure you remember Jerry Schilling's story. He actually had to stay down at the Howard Johnson down the street. But um he wanted to build a guest house. And uh, our owner, Joel Weinshanker, when we were building the hotel, made the comment, you know, if, if Elvis was actually building this guest house himself, pictures of himself everywhere. So kind of wanted to stay true to that. So I always like to like give people that note before they come and stay, because then they're going, but wait, this is like the Graceland hotel. It's Elvis's hotel. Why don't I see him? It's almost like they're a little disappointed because you've got this beautiful man. Why not use his image everywhere? And it's like, well, we're kind of trying to stay true to, you know, this is Elvis's guest house. You are a guest. You're saying it, his guest house. And uh, that's why. But it's just beautifully decorated. We have, you know, uh, two great restaurants, a lobby bar um, and uh, a, an amazing theater. Like it's a 464 seat theater where we play Elvis movies every night. And it's definitely very busy and very packed during uh, during Elvis week. But um yeah, and we've got beautiful suites too. I don't know if you had a chance to see any of the suites. The whole seventh floor is like beautifully like themed suites. Like it's really cool. So yeah, it feels a lot like a casino without the gambling. You know, oh, very yeah. upscale. And and I, when I go and experience that, I can't help, of course, but reminisce all the way back to our old hotel that yeah. used to be there, mm -hmm. the Heartbreak Hotel, mm -hmm. and Todd Morgan, and how many times <laughs> we would all talk about. If we had a, you know, a, a upscale hotel like that, and, right? you know, so anyway, right. it's wonderful to see it come to, come to life. Yeah, it really is amazing to see this all come to fruition. And again, I, I you know, hats off to Joel Weinshanker. I mean, he's the one that made it happen because you know, as you remember, the company that was, you know, before him, they had all these master plans and they wanted to do all these great things. And then it just never happened. And then he came in and, you know, he made promises and kept them so um and that there's definitely you know probably more in the works more to come i mean it's definitely uh he definitely you know doesn't like to stay stagnant that's for sure from what we've learned because again we opened the guest house in october of 2016 and then march of 2017 you know whatever six months later we opened elvis presley's memphis uh complex where we have all of our exhibits and you know elvis's cars and the jumpsuits and that's where our ticket office is and that's where our sound stage is so you know we were we were not you know bored <laughs> during that time frame either so we were doing a lot of expansion uh projects at the time so yeah there's just so much that is new that a ton of people i know haven't even you know seen since you know the last time they came to graceland so now's now's the time well thank you for the work that you're doing to keep the Elvis name, image, and likeness alive. And Carla and Jen's, you know, pass my thanks along to them. No, Scott, and we, we should thank you. Thank you for <laughs> everything you did to keep us around. <laughs> no, hey, look, I, I love those days. And at, an Elvis week doesn't go by that I'm not flooded with fun memories and, you know, and love. People don't want to be around me in August during Elvis week, because I tell story after story after story of all the amazing things that we did together. So um, kudos to you guys for keeping the dream alive and all the great things that I know are to come. I'm well, excited about that as well. So thank you. We're excited you. too, but thank you, Scott. You are the fearless leader for the longest time and we, we really do have a lot to you. So well, thank you. And thank you also for being on our podcast.
Oh, thanks for having me. I'd love to come back. You know, I just, I love to talk, Scott, if you didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all of you listeners who've joined me, Claire, Jerry, and Alicia today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.